Today's podcast is brought to you by Eddy. Find better candidates, conduct more focused interviews, and make data-driven hiring decisions. Hire Eddy, hire faster, hire smarter, hire more. Learn more at eddy.com. Now, let's podcast. Welcome to Disrupt Salt Lake City. My name is Jared Olson, and I am joined today by Sarah Jones, the CEO of Inclusion Pro, the co-founder of Women's Tech Council, and the former CEO of Applicant Pro. So, Sarah, you just have this amazing background in HR and inclusion and diversity, and welcome. Thank you. Yeah, we're so really excited. Happy, happy to be here. Yeah. And we also have Jeanette Bennett joining us. She is the owner of Bennett Communication as well as the owner and chief in uh, editor in chief of Utah Valley Magazine, Business Q Magazine and Prosper Magazine. How are you? That's right. I'm doing great. Awesome. Thank you guys so very much for joining us. Um, we're really excited to dive into our topic today about inclusion and diversity and what we're seeing in the Silicon Slopes. And I'd love to pick your brain about it. But before we do, why don't you tell us just a little bit more about you, your background, uh, what makes you tick and, and who you are. And Sarah, we'll start with you. Great. Well, I am a recovering attorney. I start <laughs> that way because everybody always automatically has empathy for me. Um, but, you know, I actually started in a field in patent law where there's very few women. So oh, you have yeah. to have a STEM degree and then you also have to have a law degree, right, to be a, become a patent attorney. So unfortunately, my career spans uh, almost two decades now in areas where uh, in pretty male dominated areas from the very beginning of my career. So that's where I got a little bit of my start of um, see, looking around me. And actually, you know, I do a lot of work with high school girls and college girls now with Women Tech Council. And um, in my experience growing up in Utah, Utah, I actually did not experience gender bias until I got into industry. So, um, you know, just, just so that people have a reference for, you know, kind of, I, I was actually really surprised that I experienced it. I, you know, went through engineering and law school and, um, you know, worked really hard for my grades, graduated top of my class. So you can imagine my shock and surprise when I realized, wow, I did all that hard work. And really, because I'm a woman? You know, and so, um, uh, so unfortunately, gender bias is you know part of many women's yeah. experience, yeah. Um, and so I'm glad we have a chance to talk about it. Since then, I was uh, left law, and I went into tech startups and educational technology, HR technology. Um, I was fortunate enough to start Women Tech Council over 11 years ago with my co-founder Sydney Tetro, and then um, since then, have been doing a lot of consulting. Um, training now on inclusion leadership and you know unconscious bias and things that we can do to make our companies more productive that's great and welcoming for the diversity that we hire now I find it interesting you went from patent law which seems like the most secluded position where you're not interacting with people I could be wrong I don't know and then all of a sudden you move into this uh, CEO role and and uh, consultant role where you're just constantly working with people was that a weird transition or as a patent law attorney did you get to interact a lot with different individuals and coach them and build them up no you're spot on um, it was a very, pretty lonely existence. Yeah. And you can probably tell from my personality that I actually really enjoy being with people. Um, but I will say that it was a huge culture shock for me to go into the tech environment. Um, I, you know, it's professional services and now going into tech, there's a lot of people that work in professional services and um, it certainly is a culture in and of itself. But um, I will just say that I wasn't prepared and I learned a lot. And I actually learned that I actually wasn't the best collaborator oh, wow. to begin with, right? Because you work as an indiv individual contributor yeah. for 10 years. And I had a lot to learn about working with other people, getting people's buy-in. and, and Well, you do it that. wonderfully. Well, it's, it's a learning process. You figured it out, though. <laughs> That's good. Jeanette, tell us a little bit more about what you're doing uh, in Utah Valley right. and over your career. Well, I'm excited to be here, especially with Sarah. We've written a lot about... Women's Tech Council and She Tech and all the wonderful things that uh, she and Sid and others have done. And so I'm excited to be here with her and with you and to talk about this. So about 20 years ago, I started um, a publishing company. So I had graduated from um, from BYU with a master's in communication and, and a bachelor's. And uh, I didn't plan on becoming an entrepreneur, but I became a mom. And um, at the time, the job that I, that I had, the, the full-time job, downtown job, I loved, but it wasn't, um, it wasn't super friendly for the, the mom 
work combo. And at that time, I felt like my best option was to become an entrepreneur, which is what I not not what I had planned, but uh, it worked out at that time in my life. And so since then, I've grown this company, and we we publish magazines. Of course, we have multiple digital channels. Uh, we host a lot of events, and uh, people often ask what my favorite publication is to do. And honestly, it's our Business Q publication because I oh. feel like. When I get to sit down with entrepreneurs and spend an hour or two and then do a photo shoot and things like that, my education has continued over and over and over again. And a lot of the questions I ask are, of course, for my readers, but also I ask about things I'm facing as a business owner. And so that has been really instructive for me. And uh, so in the two decades that I've been doing this, I have seen a lot of changes in the business community, mostly healthy, good changes, and especially for women. And so although there is more to do and, and more progress to make, uh, I've, I've enjoyed seeing the progress. Personally, as a business owner, I have, felt, um, I have felt honored and respected as a woman. I've been invited to sit on more boards than I probably deserve and things because I think people know that they need women's voices. And there aren't, or at least haven't been, as many um, high-profile women that they think they have to choose from to sit in, on these boards or to speak at these events or things like that. And so I feel like I've definitely had a lot of opportunities because of that. I think people realize that they need women. Um, in fact, I've interviewed so many entrepreneurs through the years that their boardroom is full of men and their customers are women. And they see the problem. They just don't always know how to solve it. And it, and it isn't just a one-step push the button and it's solved kind of a thing. But I've enjoyed talking to uh, entrepreneurs and, and women through the years about the issue. How many women entrepreneurs are, are there in the Silicon Slopes right now? Um, I mean, a handful have come to mind, Susan Peterson mm -hmm. and Vanessa Quigley. And um, are we seeing an influx of more women entrepreneurs? And, and for Food Group just announced Shauna is taking right. over for Andrew, which is kind of a big deal. Um, is, is this movement happening on an entrepreneurial level or um, where, where is the movement taking place in Utah business? Well, I think we have to segment that out a little bit. So I think in terms of entrepreneurs generally, women, um, there's a lot of women entrepreneurs in the state of Utah. Now, if you look at tech entrepreneurs, then it gets very, very small. And so what I like to do when I think of tech entrepreneurs is I actually count women founders in that not they don't necessarily have to be the CEO, but if they are on the founding team as a stated co-founder, I sort of categorize them also as entrepreneurs because they're joining earlier, they're right. taking risks similar to the other founders. But that group, even if you count uh, all women founders in tech companies, and then there's some hybrid companies like Chatbooks, like... Um, uh, Jane.com, Jane.com, mm -hmm. right? E-commerce companies that that kind of sometimes are counted in those tech entrepreneurs, but you're still looking at maybe 25 in in that in the tech 25 to 30 that I know of. Okay, cool. But then, but then you know, in the entrepreneurial space generally, there's a lot I of women who have started product companies, like you mentioned, mm -hmm. Susan Peterson, and she's really the pioneer in in that industry in our community for women. Uh, but Fawn Design came on her coattails, you know, other other women are stepping forward. And Betty's and yes. uh, I love yeah. Betty's. Got one in every bed in her house. Yeah, I love it. And uh, the work that Sarah is doing uh, is making it so our next generation, it's not gonna be just 25. We're gonna have many more because these high school girls are getting exposed to women in STEM, women in tech, and um, they're seeing the possibilities. And I think that's been the hard thing when I was, an undergrad and taking business classes, I had a whole semester long lecture series. There was not one woman speaker in the whole semester. So I never saw the whole person I was hoping to become. But now those examples are out there, and so I'm excited to see what the next generation does with those heroes that they have in front of them. What about um, are, are, when a female is an entrepreneur or a founder of a company, do they, are you seeing that they typically employ more stay-at-home moms? So a uh, business idea that I'm thinking of is, is high fitness, right? Started by Emily, and she just like wanted to find a way to uh, not have to pay to go to the gym to exercise. And she has created her business around empowering other stay-at-home mothers to create their own business by teaching high fit. And all of a sudden, these, these stay-at-home mothers are not – they're solving the issue of workout, but they're getting paid for it, and they're creating their own business at the same time. Um, is tapping into that market happening more when it's founded by a female, or does it not matter? I think it does matter because they know the, they know the challenges. 
of being a working mom. Combining motherhood and work can be done. There's lots of examples of it, but there's unique challenges that men don't always understand. Many men do, but um, but until you've been that mom who's has a nursing baby, you don't really know what that pressure is to wake up in the morning and think through your day and go, okay, every three hours I have to think about this. Um, and so I think that those moms, they really understand and they want to help fellow moms solve the problem and contribute and use their talents and get a little bit of time away from the kids too, you know, to, to uh, utilize all of their um, capabilities and their education. Another great example along those lines is Amelia Wilcox that's doing incorporated massage, incorporate, wait, massage, incor- incorporate massage, I believe is the name of the company. But uh, another example of a great entrepreneur building a marketplace for massage therapists and um, doing it entirely her own way. I think that, you know, the the great strategic skill that women bring to the table is they can think through lots of different scenarios of how do you build a workforce? How do you think about lots of talents rather than just have this expectation that everybody's going to come to the, come to the office eight to five, you know, or more, <laughs> you know, <laughs> to build this tech startup with you. Um, they, they can think of lots of creative ways to do that. You know, Women Tech Council never had an office, never had office hours. And, you know, we don't even know what we would do with those office hours, right? Because we work on the timeline that works for us. And we're all doing it on top of our day jobs as well, right? So we have to be very lean, very, uh, you know, um, very flexible with the things that are going on in the team's lives. And so it's just really taught us and honed that skill of flexibility and adaptability. But you still get to access the talent at the same time, right? So we have lots of experience, I think, in that area just because of the nature of the juggling that we have to do. And it's cool right now because, like, the the Uber effect, I'll call it, you know, where where people can agree to work certain hours. You know, they can work their own schedule. That's happening in other industries as well. Um, the Momni app is, is celebrating child care, which is a huge, I think, the biggest barrier for women um, is the child care factor, and it's, and it's huge. But that is one solution, a, a mom trying to solve the problem for other moms. That's awesome. I love that. Okay, so there are a lot of groups in Utah that are focused on getting more women involved in business. And and I I like what you're saying, Sarah, about uh, breaking out tech from from other business. Um, With the groups like Women Tech Council that you have started, um, there are lots of award groups that are out there. There's Women Leadership Institute and others. What progress do you feel has been made because these groups are out there in our community right now? And what are the big efforts, maybe from Women Tech Council, that you're focusing on to to get more female entrepreneurs and more women in business? Yeah, well, you know, um, what's been great about being able to build Women Tech Council is we've been able to see the the change that's happened in over a decade, right? And there's a lot that has happened and a lot of effort, really. You know, um, it's great that Silicon Slopes has, you know, kind of, gelled as a community but people have to remember that there were people doing this diversity and inclusion work decades ago right really trying to move the needle and what's been exciting is um i would say when we first started it everybody was like well where are all the women in tech that was that was the topic of every single panel that i swear that i was on and now we don't have to say that anymore right we know that there's a community we know that there are hundreds of women that are building their careers in utah and that we don't We don't really need to go down this, you know, um, old reputation that we used to have of there not being any women in tech in Utah. There's hundreds of them. So then what do we do with that, right? Well, what we've done is we've raised the visibility that there's all of these women here. They're great role models. They're doing amazing things. And then now let's make sure to keep them here, right, instead of lose them to another state that's recruiting them out of here. We've got an amazing um, uh, tech community here and an amazing industry here that is growing like crazy. There's so many opportunities, but we still have work that has to be done on making sure that the networks of CEOs, which is 95 to 97% men still in the state, um, that they get networked with this exec, all of these women executives, right? And so that they can continue to build their companies and diversify their leadership teams. There's still a lot of work to be done in that particular area, um, but it's been fun to be able to raise the visibility. Up. So like the Women Tech Awards, for example, right, is our big marquee event. 1,200 people will come to that, and every year we highlight you know, 16 to plus an additional three student finalists every year that are building careers in tech, Right. And we bring 150 students to be able to see that and to visualize, you know, this could be you someday. Um, so we, we just try to think it differently. So it's maybe something that people should know about the Women Tech Council um, 
founders and executive team is that we're all entrepreneurs and we're, we've been in tech all our entire career. So, and we've also been through the STEM degree process as well. And so we've actually had experience in all of those areas. And so it's really great for us to kind of think about like, well, what's, what's the practical realities of how do we actually make change, right? Because we're actually seeing it. We're probably the ones who've talked to more women in tech in the state of Utah than anyone else. What are your barriers? What are you experiencing? What do you wish would have happened, right? What, what women executives don't want is they don't want to be told, go to a C-level training to learn how to be a C-level executive. Because that's not what men did. Men did not have to go to a C-level training to become a part of the C-suite, right? right? The, the challenge is, is those practical pathways that women aren't able to access that are more readily given to men than women. And as women tech executives, we see that, and then we say, okay, well, how do we change that? How do we make sure that these pathways are created so that we can get more women into those executive pathways instead of, you know, assuming that they're not qualified enough or not strategic enough or not, you know, whatever, good enough to be in the C-suite. Because really, you know, there's so many men that make it to the C-suite that actually aren't qualified. Let's be honest. It's an opportunity that's given to them and that we can ask, actually also give a lot more opportunity to that person who has the potential to make that leap and to be able to grow into that C-suite experience. So something that we were talking about earlier off the air was uh, there. there's amazing women in tech, but applicant tracking systems and the recruiting process is making it very difficult to find these people because they get lost in the mix. Yeah. Um, and some of the time women present themselves differently from men. Um, what advice do you have, uh, Jeanette and, and Sarah as well, on, on how HR and companies can do a better job at viewing women in these high level roles or, or maybe just in any role in general? How do we get more exposure for women in the recruiting space? I think there's thoughts for both sides of the table. So for women, uh, you know, people people talk about how women aren't. Um, we don't always think we're as qualified as we actually are. So, for example, to run for office, uh, women need seven to nine people to encourage them to do that. Men need one person, and it could be themselves. <laughs> I got this. <laughs> okay. But women tend to not apply for a job unless they're a hundred percent qualified for all of the bullet points listed. Where a man will say, well, "I got this," you know, if, if he's half qualified. And so the advice for women is to be confident. Walk in there, emphasize your strengths. Don't go in there apologizing for who you are. Be who you are and uh, talk about your potential and, and be okay bragging about yourself. Don't think of it as bragging. Think of it as confidence. You know? so, so as women, we've got a little bit of work to do that way. And it's not just in the business community. It's sometimes in marriage and in just community and, and other things where women take a second seat and we choose that seat. So that's on us. Uh, for men, I think uh, the questions and the assumptions that they make about women, those need to be addressed, and in many cases have. But, uh, for example, not all, when, a, when a person's interviewing men and women applicants, oftentimes they'll ask different questions of them. You know, they'll ask a man about strategy and his background, and they'll ask a woman, woman more personal questions about her family situation. Or they, and, and really, those questions should be the same. You should be asking a woman about strategy, about business development. Don't make assumptions. You know, you should be asking men about their family too, right? right. Yeah. 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 We're all whole individuals. Yeah. We're not just one, you know, we're not just one faceted. We're all multifaceted. So to, to come at it with that, uh, even approach, uh, for the person who's doing the interviewing, I think is very important. I think because a lot of interviews have started to be, um, over video and technology based, those are more even, I think it's when small companies like mine, when you interview just onesie twosie, I think that's when that bias can come in when you're not going in there with a set approach of how you're going to do your hiring. Cool. Sarah, uh, you've been a CEO of an applicant tracking system company. Yeah. You understand Ironically. HR, uh, ATS, and, and the process goes there. What advice do you have? How do, how do we maybe even solve that as an industry uh, through software? Well, it, it's interesting. I was actually testing a new idea of mine where I, I was t thinking about the interviewing process. And I actually think there's a lot of room for technology to actually help and not interfere with the process but i was sitting there thinking like you know if you were able to take a, a job candidate and just say just be completely honest with me what do you want right like that never happens and then secondly they'll never actually tell you the truth <laughs> right i mean in what scenario would anybody feel psychologically safe enough to be like oh well okay well now that you say that now i will i will say now ironically when when i was um it, when i was talking to the applicant pro founder 
about my role. It was interesting. He said, so what do you want? I was like, I don't know. I'm in between. So I just kind of laid it out for him because I sort of had this like, well, what do I have to lose? The worst that you can say is no. And so it was a really good reminder that, you know, if you were given the chance to really state what you want, you'd probably ask for a lot more than what you would tend to ask for, right, in person. And so anyway, my technology product idea was how do you build a marketplace where job seekers can actually tell you exactly what they want in a really safe space? And it would just match them to the company profile that would actually provide that, right? We spent a lot of time in these interviews just to realize like, yeah, that's not a good fit, right? This is a lot of energy. You know, people are, job seekers are not great at asking for jobs or asking what they want. And, you know, a lot of HR tends to be very process driven. So, you know, my advice to HR is to be very proactive, recognize when the process is fighting against you, right? So if your, um, you know, if your executive team is saying, well, gosh, why don't we have enough diversity? Don't sit there and say, well, I'm running everybody through the process. Like, I mean, I, what do you want me to do? Get really proactive, go into the ATS system and actually look at who's applying and do your own human analysis on what's going on and figure out, well, what do I need to do to fix this? Because I will hear just my, you know, anecdotally from, from externally, lots of frustration from women in tech that are like, oh, I applied to this company and never heard back from them. And I was like, oh my gosh, you should be the most hireable person on the planet right now. How is that even possible? So recognize when technology is fighting against us and be very proactive about it. Because if we are using it to help, that's great. I think there's lots of efficiencies that can be worked in, but there's a lot of stuff yet that hasn't been fixed. Like how do we build, fix the interview process, the reputation process, and all of those things that technology really can't fix for us yet, right? How do we reach out to lots of diverse networks? right? That just takes human effort, right? So recognize when you, when it's on you and then when the technology is not working for you. Yeah. Okay. That's great. Now, uh, I was recently having a conversation with someone and, and our conversation was around how there's not a lot of enterprise companies in Utah. I mean, we got a lot of startups and we've got a lot of women in tech and a lot of women entrepreneurs. Um, do we need more seasoned female executives that have worked for enterprise companies and import them from out of state? Or do you feel like the talent pool is sufficient for what we have in Utah right now? I think we need both. We are getting more women in, in, in here from out of state, and it's beautiful. They're bringing new ideas. They're bringing confidence. They're bringing a diversity of background. And that is so great because if our companies are going to grow beyond Utah, we have to understand the customer base outside of Utah. And uh, Utah is its own wonderful animal, you know? And so to bring in this outside talent has been so huge for these companies. Yeah, I think of Julie Larson Green over at Qualtrics and, and what she brought to that experience and out, not out of the state and she came in in this high executive level role and I think she's probably a key factor of what, I don't know, I'm assuming, into their acquisition. I'm but. assuming you're correct as well. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, cool. So, There's a lot of factors. Yeah. But we also need to grow from within. We also need to show our daughters and and uh, the young adults in college right now that they have a position here. They don't have to leave the state to get the experience they need. I hope that a lot of them will stay. Okay, cool. Now, we, we've talked a lot about needing more women and the women that are available and how to get them attention. Human resources is predominantly a female position, right? Um, what advice would you offer to men who want to break into working with people all day and people operations and culture and having difficult conversations and um, the softer side of business? Um, what advice would you offer to them in breaking into this profession? Well, I, I mean, I'm going to challenge you just a little bit. Like, I think, I think the HR has traditionally been seen as a soft part of the company. And I sure. think, you know, we should all start to move in this direction of seeing it as a strategic part of the company. Talent is typically relegated to the HR company. It's the most expensive, uh, you know, it's the most expensive budget line, mm -hmm. right? And it's actually where the most loss is. Yeah. So when you have to turn over employees constantly, you actually lose money for the company, right? There's anyway, we could go on and on and on about that. And so, um, and and so, I think it behooves us all to really see HR as now. I know HR itself 
you know, a lot of people within HR need to actually come up and see themselves as more of a strategic part of the organization. So that's one of, it's sort of this, <laughs> another lean in conversation we can have, right, about them stepping into a strategic role and saying, wait a minute, like, you know, the human capital part is a significant ROI for the company. So let me help drive that. So I think, um, you know, men who come into the role, if they can, you know, ensure to enhance that and drive it as a strategic part of the organization, I think it it helps everyone. Um, I think, you know, there's going to be a lot of opportunity, especially with talent acquisition and a lot of, um, you know, employee engagement, um, key metrics and drivers right now that are now starting to become much more of the C-suite conversation, right, that um, we need a lot more people to understand the strategy behind that. I was interviewing Star Fowler of Vivint, and uh, she was talking about how she went into HR because she loved people, and that was what her classmates all thought, too. Like, we love people, so HR is mm-hmm. the place for us. But she said, really, it's it's less about people and more about just solving problems, mm-hmm. and uh, that's really what, what she does. And so for a man entering that field, men or women, you know, to understand that we're all problem solvers. We're all in sales. <laughs> yeah. We're all in sales and, and in problem solving. And all of that involves people, of course, too. That's great. Okay. Let's talk a little bit about diversity. Um, and in Utah, I, I personally feel, uh, so this is the book of Jared here, that we export a lot of our talent to get experiences other places. We have a lot of missionaries that go out and live in other countries and learn other languages and uh, experience diversity. And when they come back, I don't know how often they bring that back with them. And, and Utah still kind of feels like we're, we're slowly making this push towards more an inclusive and, and diverse workplace. Um, how do we get more diversity in general, in thought and an idea? And, and do we need to import more talent into the state? Do we need to export people out to have experiences at other companies and then bring them back? Um, other than just on the female side, from a diversity standpoint, what do we need to do? Um, yeah, I think humans uh, operate in the pathway of least resistance. And so I actually served one of those missions, you know, at Spanish speaking. And when you go into an immersive culture like that, right, it's really easy to love it, to spend time and be like, oh, this is so great. And then you come back into a culture that is so different. And it's very easy to go back to, you know, the way the way it was before. Um, and so everything around inclusion and diversity, which is ironic because in tech, we find a lot about, we talk a lot about find the way, find the pathway of least resistance to the customer, pathway of least resistance to revenue, all those things. But actually when it comes to inclusion and diversity, everything requires effort, which is the big irony of the whole thing, right? It requires this proactive effort. Now, maybe something disruptive that I actually love to see because I think the title of this is Disrupt. That's right. Right? I actually would love CEOs in the state of Utah to do a roadshow, to, to actually have experience working outside of the state of Utah and actually reporting to a female. Because I think what hasn't happened is I don't think enough of our tech CEOs have ever worked for a woman as a boss or women as strategic equals. And so I think what's happened is they've built their companies, which is great, and they've done a great job building their teams um, you know, with people that look and sound like them. And then they're just very unprepared for adding diversity to their team. And, you know, and it's, um, you know, it, there's no MBA program that's going to prepare you to lead a diverse team. There's no life experience unless you really have the life experience, right, that will teach you to lead a diverse team. So how do you give CEOs that life experience where then it becomes a much more natural part of how, because right now it takes effort, right? They have to learn a new skill. Um, and then how do, you, how do you make it become more of a natural part of their leadership skill set? Anyway, I think a CEO roadshow or, or yeah. some sort of, uh, um, some sort of um, foreign exchange I like that. <laughs> at the CEO level, right? Would do, be, do I want to write that story. That's really yeah. instructive. Uh, that is, right? That's a great idea. What CEO went and went off site for like the wife months. swap let's do the ceo swap. Oh, right. yeah ceo swap <laughs> yeah there undercover ceo yeah, um right. so well, can i go back to the mission thing for please a yeah so one thing that i i feel like missionaries come home and they've had this usually great experience learning a new culture learning a new language and then they're afraid to put it on their resume i have all these awkward conversations where people are like i spent two years in brazil as a volunteer you know they're but they're 
they're almost afraid to say what, what they were doing. I want to hear about it. I honestly do. What did you learn there about business? You know, and I, I, I love it. I think it's a great part of our culture. And usually when I interview people about why they love doing business in Utah, they bring up the language skills that our, our community has. So I think we need to embrace it and not be embarrassed of it. I totally know? agree. And, you know, HR are the people who say you can't ask religion questions in an interview and at work and you shouldn't bring it in. But I say let's weigh that opportunity cost. And you learn so much about someone if they are going door to door and having conversations with people who don't necessarily want to hear it. I mean, if anybody can sell, it's somebody like that, right? right. And two years of hard work ethic. And so I say bring it up. Mm-hmm. Um, so- Go totally, ahead. which which I think, you know, which is why I'm pretty fearless when it comes to talking to people. But I will, I will mention on the diversity and inclusion, you know, front that it is a very structured experience and there are very strict rules about gender interactions. And so it's not a place where they're going to learn how to work with people of the opposite sex. Um, and I think the rules have changed a little bit, but I mean, you know, back when I was there I was reporting up to a man, right? And so it's still not an experience where they're going to be reporting to a female. Um, and so, so yeah, That's I think I think life experience, mm-hmm. it's, it's a great expander. Um, but I think in interacting with those of the opposite sex, it's not, it, it might fight a little bit against, in fact, a lot against. Um, now these, uh, you know, students are expected to go into the workplace and their life experience up to that point has largely... Um, consisted of an experience that has taught them very strict gender roles. So now they go into corporate, which is a very fluid environment, and it is um, they. And then they pick up the cues from what's happening, you know, from the higher ups, right? Again, which is why leadership is so critical in building these cultures. And so it becomes. Um, I think on that front, I'd love for something to be different. Mm-hmm. What, Jeanette, what are you seeing in Utah Valley as far as diversity? I, I mean, when I think of Utah Valley, it's, you know, the happy valley capital of the world. That's right. Um, and, and you don't, I don't see a ton of diversity there. What is happening to make the county more diverse? Uh, there is an increased diversity, especially of women in the, in the career world and in the, um, in the workplace. Although it's still a struggle for me when I'm naming, say, the 10 coolest entrepreneurs I have to often think about the women because I've already featured the ones everyone knows about. <laughs> and so uh, we still have some work to do to get women in those top leadership positions. But there are a lot of women in their 20s that are a lot more fearless than I was. You know, I'm a couple decades ahead of them. And I'm excited to see what that next generation will do. They also have the technology at their fingertips that's working in their favor as well. So that's really exciting. As far as ethnic diversity, we have a long way to go. Uh, we have a Latino population, which is awesome and very industrial, um, but they, they're not in the, in the, around the boardroom either in, in most cases. And I'd like to see that. I'd like to see more of that. And you know, most, most of the CEOs that I interviewed, they want the diversity, but they don't know how to do it. And it's what they're used to, like Sarah was saying. Those are the, the cues that they're used to, and, and that's the path of least resistance. Um, the parity pledge and other things that people have done, these are all tools. There's not one button that's going to fix this. I think awareness is huge. I think empowering, uh, empowering diversity from a young age, both gender diversity and ethnic diversity is really important. And there are a lot of people doing good things with that. I brought up SheTech again, but that's, that's one of the, the programs that I'm a huge fan of because it's exposing these girls to dreams. You know, they, they need dreams. They need to be able to see what the opportunities are. So um, I think we have quite a bit of, of work to do. But in the 20 years I've been doing this, I have seen some progress. That makes me excited. So does that ethnic diversity come from some kinds of legislation changes to create, you know, incentives or reasons for out-of-state or uh, – visa scholarships or something to bring uh, students with all the colleges or employees into into the valley? I mean, how do you think we solve the ethnic challenge of Utah Valley? Government has a role, but I think a bigger role is in, in ourselves. It's in Silicon Slopes. It's in the leadership itself. It's in our choices. Um, with my publications, I've tried to hire or highlight, I should say, a lot of diversity, and it takes effort to find it, but I, I just want people to see. We are more diverse than you know. We tend to know our little four-block radius really well, and there might not be diversity there, but if you look at the community as a whole, there's more than than you realize, and so just 
getting that cross section, um, some limelight along the way, I think helps as well. That's cool. Okay. So with this being a disrupt podcast, I'd love to know any companies or people you are aware of that are doing some real creative things when it comes to creating a more inclusive and diverse workplace. Um, Anybody that stands out to you, unique practices, advice you would give to C-suite members that are listening to this or HR professionals, a few takeaways and golden nuggets for them about what they can do to create a better IND program in their company. Well, you know, I, you know, on the, on your um, question of enterprise companies that are doing things well, I think Adobe is definitely a leader. And I think one of the things they've done really well is, when they built their diversity leadership committee, it was very, very broad, right? It wasn't just woman focused. And I think, you know, when you have the resources to do that, that's really important um, because there are a lot of aspects of diversity, right? Gender being one of them, um, but there's so many more, right? LGBT is important, veterans, people with disabilities and abilities, um, you know, neurodiversity, and just it goes on and on and on, right? Socioeconomic diversity, um, immigrants. Um, and so anyway, when you've got a company like Adobe that has lots of resources to be able to build uh, a strong voice around this, that's really cool to see. And I think for the state of Utah, that's been really great. The, um, I think Adobe does it well. Um, Dell EMC is another one that I think does it really well and really extends the tentacles out you know, as far as they possibly can with you know, even grant funding right, to help drive um, nonprofits and the work that they do. So I think on the large company size, they've done really great things. I think on the startup size, I, I kind of want to talk about that because you know, there's kind of this feeling like, oh, I can't afford to, to think about diversity until my company's about 100. And it's kind of too late. I mean, not too, it's never too late, but gosh, you filled up your executive team by then. I mean, you've established a culture. Yeah. You've Mm -hmm. established, you're not going to fire anybody to hire. Let's be honest. Right. Mm -hmm. So you've already built so much into it. So I love to think about the companies that are starting at a small stage and doing it. Right. I mean, and it's totally possible. And I want to kind of demystify and debunk that myth that you cannot start a startup without thinking about diversity because there's a lot of them that do. And what happens is when you do that at a very young stage, it becomes part of your culture, right? The expectations are already set. And it doesn't mean you're going to do anything, everything perfectly, but it does mean that as the founder of the company, you can start talking about it from very early on and set that expectation. And people will come to your company because they love that, right? So um, a lot of companies that I think, so a fun example is Degreed. When um, we do a fun pitch competition at Women Tech Council, we have a talent summit every May. And we actually have companies um, pitch why they're the best companies for women in tech. So that's another change, right? Like companies are bragging about it. They were not bragging about it 10 years ago. So, um, but, you know, Degreed, Kat Kennedy is the chief product officer there now. But it was really fun to hear her um, talk about how they really, you know, encouraged a 50-50 teams where wherever possible now obviously in engineering it's hard but if you don't really try right 25 is about the standard but you know if you can encourage people to get more that's great 30 percent engineering team that's awesome um but they had like an unlimited maternity leave policy unlimited you just had to come back to the company for as long as you took your maternity leave. So, I mean, right, just thinking really creatively like they paid for her nanny, right? I mean, there's just all these things that you can think about. And really for her, it was fun to hear her say, they made it work because I told them what I needed to make it work. And they listened. And, you know, I think that is the key is if you're really set on now obviously you have to be a funded company for for that to happen bootstrap companies are in a little bit of a different um a different ball game but there's plenty of funded companies that if they're serious about bringing diversity early on ask the people that you want to come work for your company what do you need us to do how do you need us to help you be able to succeed mm-hmm. and if they were to do that more i guarantee that they would be able to hire more diversity that's great. Jeanette, yeah. anybody come to mind for you? So Young Living Essential Oils is doing great things for women. Their, uh, their C-suite is half women. They are um, really focused on that. They're doing it on purpose. Uh, Mary Young is the, is the president of the company. Um, her husband, Gary, was the 
co-founder with her. He's passed away. So I believe it's the largest women-owned company in the state of Utah. They did $2 billion, uh, this past year. And so they have seminars for women. They have lunches for women. They, they really celebrate and encourage, encourage that. And like Sarah said, they've asked the women what they want. They've done surveys. That's one way to, to figure it out and to give them. Don't just assume that you know what they want. Four Foods Group, we mentioned that earlier. They're another one that has really promoted uh, women. And it's a very fast-growing company, one of the fastest-growing companies in Utah County. We've honored them for years in our UV50, where we name the top 50 businesses. Sean is an excellent leader. Andrew's still there with her, but they have diverse roles, and I love the way that they respect each other. And they bring their own, um, their own selves to the table. It's not like she's trying to be him and he's trying to be her. One of my passion projects has been going back to the, the UN for the Commission on the Status of Women in the past handful of years. And one of the fallacies that is really rampant back there is, for, is that for women to be equal, they have to be more like men. And in a lot of cases, they're encouraging and showing examples of women who didn't get married or have children. That's the way to be like men and equal to men. Whereas I think women can be women and still be powerful and successful. Uh, that doesn't mean we have to change. We have to be more manlike. So I, and I love that um, Shauna and Andrew Smith are great examples of that. Jane.com is another one where they have a lot of uh, they have a great office set up for women. And they know women have needs. They have a hair salon in there. They've got childcare and di- diapers, all, all the things that moms really need. And Chatbooks has their mom force where they've said, okay, we've got moms out there who have intelligence, who want flexibility. We're going to put them to work and it's going to be- benefit them and us. And so I think companies have just gotten really creative and tapped into that. And an under- underlying theme, and I'll just spell it out here and I'll relate it to Vivint, is that the more that it can be tied to business strategy, the more you're going to succeed. So Vivint is a great example of a company who kind of woke up and they said, wait a minute, our customers are, are, most of them are women. And so what you saw is that their entire executive team demographics changed because they realized, oh my gosh, we need more women in leadership. We need more women at all areas of the company, women making product decisions, women in the engineering team. So they went full force from the executive level on down to revamp their whole workforce and they keep and they track data around it as well and so and and I will tell you that I get the sense and I'm not I'm not sure but I actually don't think it was a woman that drove that conversation at Vivint and I think that's really important to remember that men can absolutely be driving this conversation and in many cases like in our our pitch competition it's male champions that are up there um, pitching for their company because the 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 most influential decision makers un- unfortunately right now because we've got ninety five percent men CEOs are the men right and so men can absolutely change their entire culture by being very aware of how diversity and inclusion drives their business strategy and being very um, proactive about taking a leadership role there. That's great. Um, Final question for you. Uh, Let's say we have an HR professional that's listening to this and saying, this is great, but my CEO or my manager would never sign off on this. What advice do you have to that HR professional who who has been assigned inclusion and diversity, is trying to push it, but keeps hitting roadblocks? Well, dang, are there still companies like that? (laughs) Who are these people? (laughs) Jump ship. Go find a new job. That's the advice, <laughs> There's right? There's a lot of opportunities. There's so a lot going growing. on. There is so much, much research that shows <laughs> that if you have a diverse group of executives, you're going to be more successful. So I think just showing the data, that person, whoever this person is that <laughs> needs some help, they, they sound like they're analytical. And so I think data might be the best thing to uh, encourage them. And the data is there that shows what benefits are straight to the bottom line. Oh, is there any data you're aware of locally for Utah? Does Women Tech Council have something like that? Um, where we're tracking data? You know, we haven't. We, you know, but we want to be careful about not really being a compliance engine, right? And so we don't track like diversity data. That it's, that's all self. I think Instructure was the first Utah company to actually provide their own diversity data. And I think the thing that scares people the most about that, they're like, oh no, people will, will see. And I'm like, well, guess what? Nobody's nailed it yet. Like there's nobody that's 50-50, so you don't have to be worried about it, right? But for right now, I think most people just keep that internal and in-house. But I will say that Women Tech Council has an inclusion and diversity forum, and the whole purpose of that forum, um, mostly it is HR professionals that come, 
Um, but typically it's somebody that has some oversight over the culture of the company. Um, uh, but the purpose of that is to share best practices. And sometimes we do have, you know, the sharing of how do I get an executive champion on board? How do I partner with my CEO? Because really, you know, there's really nothing that can be successfully done without the CEO as the partner in all of these, especially really big ones like, like pay equity, right, or really um, important um, leadership mentorship programs and things like that the ceo absolutely has to be on board and so um the best way is to really learn from other people well what worked for you and it might be data and it might be something else right we don't know but um get ideas from other professionals there's forums to do that such as the diversity and inclusion forum women tech council i know disrupt hr has forums as well and, and is able to gather those professionals together for these conversations but there's a lot of resources um and, you know, I've just found that it is really hard to be the only change agent within our organization. So um, finding another executive that really feels um, re that this is an important conversation and can act as your executive advocate can also um, go a long ways in having maybe some, you know, important conversation and heart to heart with other executives that can help move the needle. Okay, great advice. Any parting thoughts you guys have for us? Well, I think this is, a, you know, obviously one of my passion conversations. And I think, you know, ironically, um, you know, it's I've been speaking less about diversity lately, but more about inclusion, because we can do lots and lots of work to hire for diversity, but actually not be inclusive. Right. And that's actually what is going to, from a strategic standpoint, get the best productivity, get the best you know, thinking of all of these great people that we've hired. So I like to kind of end on, um, you know, just making sure we're really thinking about inclusion as kind of our end goal with all of this uh, work that we're doing. And I would just say it is an awesome time to be in business. I think it's an awesome time to be a woman. And uh, I think that there's more work to do. But I think if we go at this positively, um, you know, we have the Women's March and things that are kind of pointing out things that are wrong. But I think there's also a great opportunity for us to celebrate what's going right and what's going well because those things are happening. And when we acknowledge things that are going well, I think they get repeated. And so um, I just want to celebrate what's going right and how much progress we have made in, in my lifetime. So many great things have happened. And uh, we're creating a better world for our children and for, for the young men and young women that will follow us. And so I'm excited. It's going to be a great decade. And I'm really grateful for Jeanette, too, because I think, I think one of the challenges is we have is we don't tell enough great stories, right? Um, we, we, you know, comparatively to Silicon Slopes, we're kind of a small pond, right? right? And so sometimes it's, it's you know, uh, only a few stories that, that get told. And the more stories we can tell about what's really going on here, the great people that are here building the community um, of hundreds and thousands of people in tech here, the more that people will understand um, really what Utah's all about and really what the tech industry here has to mm. offer. Thanks. I do think stories connect us and inspire Absolutely. us. Great. Thank you guys so very much for your time. Uh, we're so glad to have you as part of this Disrupt crowd. And thanks for all you're doing to help change inclusion diversity in, in our state and in our profession. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks.